Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us. My name is Michelle Steen and I'm the manager of public programs at the Crocker. It just started raining really hard where I am. So if you hear some rain like sounds in the background, that's what that is. Um, I want to begin with our land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that the Crocker Art Museum is on the traditional land of the Nisenan people and California is the homeland of many tribes. We are honored to be here today and are committed to working with these native nations as we move forward as an inclusive institution. I will add that the land the museum sits on is unceded territory and recognize that the institution of the Crocker Art Museum was founded through and has benefited from colonialism. This was largely from wealth gained by the Crocker family from the transcontinental railroads and the lands the railroads crossed. We're including a link in the chat where you can learn more about two local tribes, one being the Nisenan tribe of the Nevada City Rancheria who continue to seek federal recognition. Please visit their site and support them in their efforts. We also thank the Shingle Springs Band of Miwok Indians and their Cultural Services Division who have helped us to develop our land acknowledgement and continue to share their insight, collaboration, and time. Thank you. I'd like to go over some logistics. We encourage you to use the chat feature to communicate with us and other attendees. If you have any logistical questions, you can directly ask Crocker Art Museum. Any questions for the panelists can go in the Q&A and we will have time for some questions. If you want to access live closed captions, you can click on the button at the bottom of your screen. Our chat will be very active. So if it interferes with the captioning, we recommend that you open the chat so it appears at the right of your screen. In the unlikely event that we are Zoom bombed, the panelists have all agreed to continue with the discussion once we've removed those responsible. So we encourage you to make the choice that is best for you and your well-being. Uh, our community expectations. We ask you to assume good or neutral intentions to show up however you can and to know that every voice is welcome and valued here. In this space, we expect that people will have respect and empathy in their comments. Anyone using abusive or hateful language will be asked to leave or be removed. We don't anticipate this, but we want to be clear so that everyone understands. Now, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Gloria Nafee, who is Vice President of the Crocker's Board of Directors and who's going to share a few words with us about the board and their role in this area. Welcome, Gloria. We got to unmute you first, though. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. Uh, greetings to all of you. My name is Gloria Nafee, and I'm a member of the Crocker Art Museum Association's Board of Directors. I am excited to be its incoming president, and I'm so pleased to be with you here today. <clears throat> Under the guidance of Randy Sater, the current Crocker Art Museum Association's president, we have made great efforts in establishing a board that is reflective of the Sacramento region. We are enthusiastic at how art can play a role in creating community connections and a sense of shared humanity. We realize that board diversity is an important part of creating a community institution that is of public value, but we know that is not the only step we need to take. As a board member and future president, I look forward to exploring a variety of ways to ensure that the museum is relevant to all and a cultural cornerstone for the Sacramento region. Many of us on the board were amazed at the number of staff it takes to make the museum function and succeed, but it also takes community partners, collaborators, and champions. It definitely takes a village. The museum uh, should also value those who work at the museum, visit it, and do work with it in any capacity. But even more so, we want to make sure that those who felt excluded from the Crocker and any museum in general 
know that the Crocker is theirs too. Today's program is about being on a journey to know and do better. And I thank you for engaging with us in this conversation. I'm joined by many of my fellow board members today, and we look forward to listening and learning, and more importantly, working with all of you to create positive and sustained change, focus on equity, access, and inclusivity. On behalf of the CAMA board, I thank our panelists and all of you for attending today. Thank you, Gloria. We really appreciate that. And if anyone wants to know more about the Crocker Board, you can visit uh, the link in the chat. So currently um, at the Crocker, we have an exhibition um, of successive shows in the community gallery called Multiple Horizons, Native Perspectives at the Crossroads and Tribal Perspectives from the Confluence. This was created in collaboration with Concept Art Plus Movement, an incubator of arts and culture, El Dorado. And it features uh, California Indian, Native American and indigenous artists, community and youth. Tribal Perspectives from the Confluence is presented by the Shingle Springs Band of Miwok Indians exhibits and collections and traditional ecological knowledge departments. I don't know that the museum will be able to open per county guidelines before the exhibition closes, but luckily we have both shows online, as well as presentations by some of the featured artists. You can find all of those in the chat links or on our YouTube page. So we are very honored today to have Shante Parks, an artist whose work is featured in the first exhibition, here to share more about her artwork and her story. Welcome, Shante. Hi, thank you. I'm honored to be here with everyone. So we're going to pull up um, a couple of pieces that you created. And um, I've been lucky enough to see in person. And um, they're, they're beautiful on the screen, too. But I think uh, we would love to know more about just your creation process and anything else you want to share about this artwork. Sure. These two pieces are a huge departure from my usual style. I love to paint in oils and acrylic and pastels. I have a huge diversity of mediums that I use, but my style is generally very realistic. And these are not. These are way more abstract. And they came about um, as a result of a field trip that just a handful of us got to do in 2016. We took a trip to visit the basket collection held by the state parks at Mather's warehouses in Sacramento. And that was the first time that natives were allowed to go and visit this collection of baskets that's housed. And it was an incredibly emotional experience. It was just amazing. Um, the collection had been moved from downtown Sacramento to its current location. And for two years before I got this opportunity, I had prepared, mm -hmm. I had said prayers, I went to ceremony, I collected medicine and sent to bless and take care of the space where these things were housed. And then all of a sudden I got the opportunity to go and visit them myself. So we spent the day with these baskets, um, myself and a few other ladies. Thank you to Sigrid Benson and the Maidu Museum for affording us that opportunity. And it was amazing to see this living bridge to our past. And it was just amazing for us. So these paintings were the result of seeing that whole process, the, the whole, story that I saw on so many baskets. There were depictions of ceremonies, of people, of animals. And the thing that struck me is that it was celebrating the balance of life and the balance of our cultures and how just everything has to be in balance and then it will all be well. So I came up with these two paintings. They just they were really fast they just came out and they are filled with the basket 
designs that I found in the collection in the background and it's two ceremonial dances. Um, one is the woman on the left here. She has um, a dance sash and it's a basket pattern that is woven into her dance sash. There are symbols of dancing women, of mountains, of acorn basket patterns, so many things in that painting. When you see it in person, you can just see more and more images the longer you stare at it. And the same is true for the male dancer. There are so many patterns and so many different energies that went into that. And it was all based on this incredible experience that I had. So that is the birth story of these two paintings. And I should add, I really was not fond of these paintings when I created them. It was just so out of the ordinary for me, but they've really grown on me. And they've taught me a lot about appreciating our culture and the cultural arts. And it is always a growing and learning process when you're involved with art. Thank you so much, Dante. Can I ask where these paintings will go after they're at the Crocker? I have had them for sale, but they are coming home with me after they leave the Crocker. They may go visit some other places, but <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I've definitely come to appreciate them for the, the bigger symbolism that they've become for me. And I think we have a couple questions, if you don't mind, actually about the size of the pieces, because obviously most people haven't been able to see them. Um, can you <laughs> share, share their size? Yes, they are approximately 19 by 24 inches a piece. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for sharing. I, I love this work and um, it's a gift for us all to be able to see them. It, it definitely is and I appreciate it. These, I'm so happy that you chose these two because they, they're local dancers, first of all. <laughs> and they're really representative of this, this whole thing. This, this was perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, I know people are, are saying they love the work, of course. So thanks again. Yep, thank you. So um, to begin our discussion, I'd like to acknowledge all the work that has been done in the museum field by many dedicated people for many years to really make our museums better places. We're sharing a very comprehensive resource link um, compiled by LaTanya Autry in the chat of uh, Museums Are Not Neutral. And I encourage you to click on it and save it for later. Uh, there's years worth of reading in there. Um, this month, I also want to highlight um, some contemporary art curation uh, and a book that I just bought. Um, and it's featured, um, the uh, founder of Gallery Girls, if you haven't heard of them, we're putting a link to that as well in the chat, uh, Jasmine Hernandez. And it's writing that features BIPOC women and queer, non-binary and transgender artists. Uh, it's a beautiful book and um, you can buy it wherever books are sold, I believe. So that's my, that's my book of the month. Um, like many art museums nationwide, the Crocker has been working on its own internal challenges. Um, these have included staff petitions to leadership for more accountability, public criticism and discussion, and internal initiatives to encourage culture change from within. This work is always ongoing. Uh, we don't position the Crocker as a leader in this area, but we want to use our platform to be a community gathering space as we often were when we could meet in person. As the Crocker continues to work on its commitment to equity, both internally and to the public, I have hope that facilitating these conversations will move the needle forward and involve more people like you. This series explores the idea that in order to be relevant and sustainable moving forward, museums need change from the inside out. In the series, we examine how institutions have been places of exclusion and erasure from their very foundations, affecting communities, staff, and the people represented in their collections. Museums have really suffered from a visible lack of representation and deeply embedded histories of power imbalance and hierarchy. 
we hope this series can be a starting point and with everyone's contribution might open new conversations and affect changes for both the Crocker and other cultural institutions. Last month, we looked at internal staff-based practices and March will focus on BIPOC artists and arts movements in the Sacramento area. If you miss one, they will all be posted to our YouTube page and you'll also be able to find all of the resources that we share in the chat today under the video. We invite you to visit that page and subscribe to our YouTube channel. A link for that will be in the comments. We also hope you can join us April 8th for a regional Native American artist showcase where we'll get to see the work of and hear from several local Native artists. Uh, you can look for that on our website, should be posting soon. And you can also see more of our digital offerings on our website, um, Museum From Home page. We also have a great store where you can buy museum things to support us. If you um, want to see more programming like this, uh, we hope that you consider becoming a member or making a donation if you're able. Links for all of that will be in the chat. So now I am very happy to introduce our panelists for the night. Dakota Hoska is an enrolled member of the Oglala Lakota Nation, Pine Ridge Wounded Knee. She joined Denver Art Museum in 2019 as the Assistant Curator of Native Arts. Previously, she worked as a curatorial research assistant at the Minneapolis Institute of Art, supporting the exhibition, Hearts of Our People, Native Women Artists. Hoska completed her MA in art history, focusing on Native American art history at the University of St. Thomas in Minnesota. Her curatorial work allows her to work closely with her Native community while being continually surrounded by and learning about beautiful art. Lori Egan Headley earned a Bachelor of Science in Anthropology from UC Riverside and a Master's of Arts in Anthropology and Museum Studies from CSU Chico. Lori has over 24 years of museum experience and has worked in Native community museums for 15 of those years. She is the Director and Curator at Barona Cultural Center and Museum and serves on the Board of Directors for Western Museums Association and the San Diego Museum Council. Egan Headley enjoys DIY projects and loves spending time with her family, her seven-year-old daughter, her husband, and Brownie, a rescued beagle. Brittany Arona is an enrolled member of the Hoopa Valley Tribe. She is currently a PhD candidate at UC Davis in Native American Studies with a designated emphasis in human rights. Arona completed her Master of Arts in Native American Studies at UC Davis in 2018 and her Master of Arts in Public History at California State University, Sacramento in 2014. Brittany is interested in repatriation, federal Indian law, cultural resources management, indigenous environmental justice, and environmental history as they relate to California Indian tribes. Her dissertation researches, research focuses on Hoopa, Yurok, and Karuk perspectives of visual sovereignty, memory, human and water rights, on the Klamath River Basin. Unfortunately, Catherine Ben Marcuse is unable to join us today, but we look forward to seeing her again in the future. So Brittany, Lori, and Dakota, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to start asking you if you can share a bit about your current work um, in Native Arts and Culture in the museum or collections field and um, something that you're focused on right now. We'll start with uh, Dakota. I'm Takepi. Chante washte ana pechi usati. Hello, my relatives. I shake all of your hands with a good heart. Um, I work as the assistant curator of Date of Art at the Denver Art Museum, and right now I am happy to say that we are in the middle of a huge reinstallation of our third floor galleries. So that's the large project that I have going on right now. Since coming to the Denver Art Museum, those galleries have been closed. So I'm really excited to have our materials back on site and to really um, get a closer look at the collection items. Um, my, folk, my work, I feel, focuses around collaboration and facilitation. 
Um, I really like to work together with people to achieve a vision. And that really started with my work um, in Hearts of Our People, working on that exhibition, which was a huge collaborative process with over 20 um, uh, Native American and Indigenous and non-Indigenous scholars coming together to uh, put together an exhibition that really paid homage to the often overlooked contribution of Native women artists who are creating most of the artwork um, in our communities. So from that process, I really, I feel like I learned things are always better when there are more voices involved and the end result is always stronger than something I could have done by myself. So I love, I love that aspect of my work. Thank you. Brittany, would you like to share? Yes. Uh, hey, Uncle Kamalio. Uh, it's really nice to be here on this rainy afternoon in uh, Sacramento, Nisanan um, lands. I, um, in addition to trying to finish my dissertation in a timely manner, um, so my dissertation really looks at the ways in which Hupa, Yurok, and Kruk artists have used uh, visual sovereignty. So I'm thinking about people like Lynn Risling, Julian Lang, uh, Brittany Britton, who have been using art as a form of um, considering the Klamath River Basin and dam removal on the Klamath. So that's been a really um, a long ranging project that started with the museum exhibition that I did at the, um, sorry, my cat wants to join the meeting, um, a museum exhibition that I did at the at California State University when I was doing my uh, master's. But um, I'm also working full time, which is a little insane while doing a PhD, but I'm working full time with California State Parks as the Tribal Affairs Program Manager. And so this program developed in 2017 and um, I was hired in 2019 as their first California Indian Tribal Affairs Program Manager that to come on and help facilitate relationships between state parks and uh, tribes in California. So it's related to everything as diverse as gathering policies in the state. Um, so gathering on our traditional lands that are now managed by state parks, collections management, so helping to facilitate collections management on that end. And then um, unfortunately, state parks has a rather large NAGPRA program. My cat really wants to make an appearance here. Uh, so NAGPRA, Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. So unfortunately, we have a large NAGPRA collection within state parks because of the legacy of collecting that occurred. And so um, I helped to oversee that and hopefully get ancestral, our ancestors home and items of cultural patrimony home. And so that's really, I, I work on any number of things for state parks related to that. And I feel really fortunate to be in that position to help collaborate and consult with uh, tribes in, you know, across the state and also around the world too, because we also have collections that interact with indigenous nations in other places. So it sounds like you're not too busy then. Um, thank you, Brittany. Lori, do you mind sharing? Thank you. Um, well, recently we have um, received a grant and we have been collecting what is left of the people's creation story and other philosophies. Uh, we've been able to mine ethnographic materials from across the United States, you know, where these things have been getting dusty, sitting on shelves, obviously not really um, usable to those institutions because they're so far away from home. So we've um, been able to bring these materials back, uh, have the people look them over, uh, share their uh, remembrances of these philosophies they learned, and we've compiled it in a book form and given it to um, the tribal members here so that they have the connection to their heritage and their and the philosophies of their ancestors. Um, so we're working on a, a permanent exhibit about that, uh, about sharing the people's creation story. And uh, post COVID, it's a little bit difficult to do, uh, but we're still working on it. Thank you. Um, and I wanna also say that, you know, some of the concepts and the things that we're talking about 
some people may not have heard of before. And we're trying to offer a lot of resources in the chat. So as a, an attendee, if you hear a term or something you're not familiar with, hopefully there's some, some information in there so we don't leave anyone behind. Um, but please continue to share your questions with us. And on that note, I really wanna start um, just with a bang. Let's talk about <laughs> decolonization. Um, so for several years now, there's been a lot of discussion and movement around decolonizing spaces, particularly institutions like museums and collection centers. Uh, and I'm wondering how do you decolonize colonized spaces? Uh, a lot of people will argue that this isn't possible and could even result in maybe further harm. And I wanna share an example that a lot of people are familiar with. Um, in 2017, uh, the independent researcher and writer Sumaya Kasim from the UK wrote a well-shared piece titled, The Museum Will Not Be Decolonized as a response to her experience working as a co-curator on a decolonial exhibition in the UK. She makes the argument that institutions that are so embedded in a history and power structure of white supremacy and colonization will inevitably co-opt the decolonization to become another check mark or a buzzword like diversity. Um, so basically it isn't possible to decolonize a colonial space and shouldn't really be a stated goal. Some people suggest alternative ideas uh, and processes like indigenizing or unsettling spaces and that decolonizing is really a process, never an end. So I'd love to hear all of your thoughts and experience on this concept. Well, I'll, I'll go first because um, we had a little rehearsal, so now everybody knows that I'm really talkative. Um, but <laughs> Lori and Brittany just jump in, you know, anytime. Um, I've been thinking about this a lot lately, and, you know, that author may or may not be right, but I'm not sure that that should stop us or discourage us from trying to do this work and trying to provide other, um, other ways of seeing artwork, trying to be more inclusive and trying to, I mean, I think what's at the heart and what the author's frustration is, and I think it's the frustration of many people of color is, you know, people go about trying to like, change but not authentically and so um perhaps that's really what's at the root of a statement like that is like yeah that's not authentic change are people letting it in because are, are people letting it in and are they letting it change them because in the end these institutions are really a reflection of the people who work there and the people who visit there so that's my two cents I, I agree wholeheartedly with Dakota. And I also think there's um, uh, a sense of regionality included with that. Um, you know, if you're in a high traffic tourist spot, you know, it's definitely harder to change. And, you know, you're reliant upon people visiting and um, money from donors. Um, the board needs to be on board and it is hard. And um, I think if you're in a, um, uh, a big city, say San Diego, it, it's tough to change. Sorry, I had to have my husband get the cat because she was biting me. Um, so I think I tend to think about decolonizing and the way in which people consider decolonizing through the lens of um, e Eve Tuck and Kay Wayne, Wayne Yang's article, uh, Decolonization is Not a Metaphor. And if you haven't read that article, it's really fantastic in talking about how decolon the term decolonization has been used in ways that are not quite in keeping with indigenous thought about it. Um, mainly that decolonization means the repatriation of indigenous land and life. So I've never really been fully comfortable with using the term decolonization in museums and especially in the museum that I'm situated in now. 
um, being, you know, a state museum and the or collection center. And if we know the history of California colonization, it's a very violent history that the governor just recently said was a genocide, even though Native people have been saying that it was a genocide for many generations prior to that. Um, so, but that doesn't mean that I think that this work isn't important. If I didn't think it was important, I wouldn't be in this space. Um, that it's really important to collaborate and work with tribes in a way that in a museum space in which they become decision makers, right? Like you never wanna go, at least in my role, I, I don't wanna go to a tribe and say, hey, I made this plan for this exhibit. Look at how great it is. And this incorporates your history without ever having talked to them from the very beginning. Um, so while I don't think necessarily that museums can be decolonized, I think that there's a way that museums and museum practitioners can step aside and allow tribes to lead the way in how they are interpreted. I'm in a little bit of a different position because I, I work for a native museum and a lot of people ask, well, how are you, what you're doing? Is that so different than other museums? And truthfully, it is. Um, you know, things like the lexicon we use in our database. We don't use the California archaeology Spanish terms. We use the people's terms in their own language for the materials. And we will have researchers come in and say, oh, I want to see all your monos and matates and uh, oyas. And we say, hmm, well, we call them these things. And yes, you can see them, you know. So there's always that level of education we're doing. Um, we don't use the word village, you know, that's... Um, as a word that describes a community gathered centered around a church. And that's just not what we refer to uh, when we're talking about um, the early years. So I think there's, you know, little, little things, little, little bits that can be changed very easily. And those are just some of them. You know, we, we don't use the words folk art. Um, we don't say things like, oh, so simplistic and, you know, simple beauty of baskets, you know, it's complex, it's not simple. So that just the terminology alone uh, is huge. Yeah, language is, is very important. Um, it's interesting talking about sort of the ways big and small that we're changing. And if we're talking about working with community and the importance of, you know, a multiplicity of voices, but also, you know, Lori, like you said, your your position is more unique in that as a non-native person, you're also representing the tribe. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about uh, just sort of the some of the practices that you employ in in doing that, and that you think might are are best for people to do in your position. Uh, well, I have to say, Barona has been very wonderful, inclusive, and wonderful to me, uh, welcoming me. Um, to lead their museum, but you know, there's really not a whole lot of leading I do. Uh, I report directly to tribal council and I have a, an advisory board, uh, similar to a, a board trustees that are made up of community members. And it's the, the museum is their cultural center and museum, it's their voice, it's their history, and I'm just here to help. I mean, really, I'm here to um, serve the people and using the knowledge I gained through grad school to make that happen for them. So, you know, I, I'm not one to insert myself and say, well, you know, I think we should really talk about this. Um, we have two very divergent audiences. Uh, one is the tribal community, the native community throughout the county. Um, and then everybody else, right? So we get all the third and fourth graders here studying California history. And there's a very specific program and very specific artifacts that have to be on display at all time to teach them. And then there's all the other stuff that really is for the community. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm juggling two audiences, um, but really it's all, all native advised and it's, it's their message. Another way that we've talked about, um, and a lot of people I think in this uh, webinar might be interested in if they work in museums or they're looking to improve their relationship with a local tribe or even start a relationship if one doesn't exist. Um, I think 
there's a lot of information out there about how to go about doing that in a way that is um, trust building and and um, genuine. But I'm I'm really interested in knowing what you all think about uh, if we're talking about museums as kind of having this colonial history and so they're still sort of embedded with these uh, white supremacist kind of cultures. How how do you think if if you know community engagement is is non like non-Western in the sense that it's not going to meet capitalist standards of productivity. It needs to take time. It needs to involve a lot of people. So that's going to be slow and it can take years, right? How, how do museum workers make a case for that in their institution? And if, is it required to have um, leadership support to even do that, do you think? Or do you think that there's work people can do no matter what to, to develop relationships? I think there's work you can do no matter what. Of course, in a perfect world, you would have uh, administrative support or at least you know that they weren't standing in your way when you're trying to do that. But um, you know, in the end it is about the relationship and there's many ways to build a relationship um, that can be authentic and you know can be driven by you as simple as just reaching out to people uh, that you want to give a voice to. And if I could add um, don't let your first conversation be about money asking for money especially gaming bands gaming groups. Um, that's not always appropriate in the first meeting. I, I think something that's really important is coming to people in the spirit of collaboration rather than, I mean, I mentioned this before, rather than saying, hey, we got this really cool project that we want you to be a part of now. We've never talked to you before, but hey, you should come and join our museum just because, you know, we're a great museum. I don't think that's a good way of developing a relationship with people. Like, even if it's like some kind of open ended, hey, I want, we want to get to know you and like work towards accurately portraying your history and then being prepared that uh, being prepared to hear the maybe the very bad things that have happened related to the tribe and your museum um you know i've mentioned this before state parks has a long legacy and the state of california has a long legacy of injustice and genocide towards native peoples and so you know by virtue you know just because i'm a native person um, I also represent this entity that has, you know, disenfranchised us for lack of a, for a very mild term of what happened to California Indian people. Um, and we have to live within the reality of that, um, that museums have and continue to. Like, what are your collection holdings? Like, how are those taken? How did your museum situate itself within colonialism? and genocide because it might, it probably did. And it's past the point where I think as museum practitioners that we can say that's in the past because for native people, it's very, very present. Um, Did you want to add anything to, to that, Dakota? Why, because I'm the most talkative one? Because <laughs> we love to hear what you have to say. <laughs> um. I feel like there is just, um, there's just so much work to be done and that work is so rewarding that I wouldn't wait for the administration to come along on the journey. I would start that journey because in the end, it's also about, you know, like, it's going to be about your relationship to those people. Um, and you're going to be enriched by that no matter what position you hold within the institution. And so, yeah, just kind of coming back to your original question and to some of the things the other speakers have said, you know, we really, um, 
you know, again, it's kind of about like really being willing to listen. And I don't know where administrations fall, but, you know, I think those are lessons that's not just good to know native to native, but, or non-native to native, but like person to person. And I think, um, yeah, you don't need, you don't need an administrative edict to start that work. I agree. And if I might add one more thing, um, coming here as an outsider, you know, I've learned a lot about our ethnocentric values and how we attribute them to these artifacts, right? They're pieces in a collection. We care for their temperature and humidity and are they dirty? We make little boxes for them. They're categorized and put on a shelf so neatly. And then that, that kind of ends there. But I think if we remove our Western lenses, and look at how native people view these things. It's part of their family, right? Uh, they belong to family members. Most of the time they shouldn't still be alive right now. They should have been returned to the earth. And, um, you know, there's a whole, whole, whole other framework, whole other philosophy to view these pieces with that most Westerners don't have. So um, seconding, seconding Brittany's um, you know, need for education. Everybody needs to know what happened in California or and beyond. It's not isolated in California and know the history, know what's happened and you'll be able to easier, more easily remove those Western lenses. Yeah, and sorry, can I just bring up a point about the top-down perspective? I think it is really important to build a relationship where you're at and, you know, be a champion for tribal voices and indigenous voices wherever you are. Um, I will say though that in my experience, it has been helpful to have the top town administrative support. Um, so for thinking about even here in California, I had mentioned that California tribes have known, has have called what happened in California a genocide, but it wasn't really until the governor said it, Governor Newsom said it in 2019 that that was widely accepted. So you can think whatever you want about that, um, you know, why, you know, a white person saying it makes it more real, right? Um, so it's a, a really important to listen to tribes in their histories and work with them and meet them where they're at and recognize that you're not the expert on, you know, histories, but that administrative support is important. The top-down approach is important and directors and administrators have to be on board as well, I think. I want to go back to something, Dakota, that you said about um, how institutions are reflected, the people who work there really reflect the institutions. And so if we're talking about representation, we need to talk about staffing, obviously, and, and seeing Native people in museum positions, all kinds of positions, you know, um, and there's always a big, long pipeline discussion. <laughs> but um, I, I'd be curious to know what you think about how, uh, how we, we can support the next generation of native curators, but also native educators, native administrators. Uh, how do we make a museum more supportive of that? How do we, there's a lot of layers to that, um, but what are your thoughts on making a place, you know, that deserves native people working there? I guess one question I have, you know, when I hear this term pipeline, and um, I, I do think it's a yes and, but I'd love my um, co-panelists to weigh in too. You know, when we're talking about the pipeline, I wonder sometimes are the requirements for filling that pipeline because the pipeline is still uh, funneling in in a Western way uh, with a pre uh, pre established set of requirements that have been standardized through Western methods, without recognizing other ways of knowing. So I mean I think that is one uh, question about the pipeline, and then you know the other, which you know it's it's very big, but you know because of the history of colonization because of what these institutions have traditionally stood for, you know, people profiting off of the land stolen from indigenous people and off the backs of other people's work, 
you know, you know, probably indigenous people didn't even want to go there, you know, and I, and then I think the third thing is like also kind of looking to uh, cultural paradigms, you know, like, you know, as if, as Western art, you go and you stand and you look at the art and you know, sometimes that's not what communities want to do together is go and stand and look at art. Maybe they have a different way of appreciating art is maybe, you know, coming out of their religious ceremonies or their dance ceremonies or their celebrations. And, you know, I think, so I do think part of it is also, you know, and kind of back to the pipeline, if people can't see themselves there, if the, you know, if the structure just doesn't relate to them, they're not even going to care if they get in a pipeline, then that for sure is not related to them. I don't know, what do you guys think? I agree. <laughs> I think that was really well said. I mean, if, you know, I, I've been talking about this the whole night, but, you know, museums are very colonial spaces for people and we haven't seen ourselves here in these spaces for a long time. And, you know, there's museums I've gone to where it starts like Native people were in the past and then, oh, they're still kind of here. And then there's no gap there. Like, right, there's no, there. the history is not in, in the middle. And so I find that a lot of the times I'm educating people about this really traumatic history over and over again. Um, and really like, I want to celebrate our joy too. Um, you know, we're joy. We're there's a lot of native joy, um, and being a native person, I, I, you know, I, I laugh so much with my friends and my family. Um, but I don't think this is answering the question. <laughs> but you know, getting into these spaces is important, but it's not the end all and be all of who we are and how we represent ourselves. Thank you. I want to um, ask Lori because about, you know, what you were saying, Brittany, in our earlier discussion, Lori had talked about, you know, you were going to make a presentation. Do you want to tell that story? Yes, delicately. Um, I was invited to um, speak uh, and the group that was, you know, hosting a series of speakers wanted to do it in a timeline fashion and so that it made sense to their audience and they asked me to go first about pre-contact times uh, history of the Kumeyaay people um, before anybody else arrived and uh, I said well okay you know it's what I do I'm happy to but I can tell you that the story you know upon contact the story changes and it's not so pretty um, and then I was not I was dis de invited, disinvited to speak because it didn't suit, um, you know, the happy stories that they wanted. Um, and then to touch on the other point too, that you know, so many people come into the museum and are surprised that the people are still here, uh, that they don't live in a teepee, um, and you know, there's just so many stereotypes that we're battling still um, every day. It's it's very sad to me. Um, and I'm sure to others. So the work doesn't end um, ever. And I always find if, you know, colleagues and friends in, in other museums in town can, can kind of help with that through their exhibits, right? There's other exhibits about the Kumeyaay people in town. If they can help with these stereotypes, you know, that's a huge step um, for the people that live here in San Diego to get past that. I think this ties into what what's come up in our conversation before which gets back to like education and early education and the school systems and what people are being being taught and i think one wonderful thing is the increasing role and the role that museums have always had in you know education and how they've kind of bridged those gaps um but an increasing chance to really expand uh education for example locally in California so that children are learning about, you know, the three waves of, of genocide or whatever it is that they need to know specifically. Um, 
I'd love to hear if you could each share something that you've seen just really be successful in um, increasing visibility, representation, education, something that's gotten a positive response or, or something you're really proud of. And Dakota, I know you shared that exhibition that you had at uh, Mia, but any, anything like that, I'd love to hear. You go first. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, hiring native people. Um, so state parks has made an effort over the years with um, hiring Native people to come into the parks, those that want to. And there is a lot of interest, I think, from folks in the state, Native people in the state to come in and, you know, work parks. Um, there's a lot of success up in the North Coast Redwoods with hiring interpreters to interpret their own histories at, you know, village sites that they have lived in for since time immemorial and allowing them to actually create those programs with limited, you know, hands-on non-native voice. So that's been hugely successful in state parks in having, you know, the tribe, Euro, it's a Yurok tribe that's working on, Yurok tribal members that are working on that, and Hoopa tribal members, but coming into the park and, and doing that type of work. Um, you know, having these <laughs> jobs in parks where native people are working in their collection, in their collections. Um, you know, for me, my own personal experiences has, it has been incredibly rewarding to work with other Native people about issues that have been ongoing in parks. And though I do represent that, you know, place, I've also been able to build wonderful relationships with people across the state and trying to either repatriate things back um, to get accurate voices and our accurate stories out there and collaborating and listening. Um, you know, I'm not the end all and be all of California Indian history. It's the tribes and it's tribal people who are telling us their stories. And I think that's really important. I've said it before, allowing Native people to lead the way because we have been leading the way <laughs> since time immemorial. Well, I might say that um, your land acknowledgement, Michelle, was a success because that wouldn't have happened five years ago, I don't believe. And whether, you know, and I know that our communities are real, a real um, you know, not quite sure what they think or feel about land acknowledgements. The fact that it's a step that wouldn't have been taken um, just probably even two years ago, I don't know when you put your land acknowledgement in place, but it's, it is bringing visibility um, in a way that wouldn't have happened a few years ago. And I have to think like all of us who are, who are doing this work, you know, fum, you know, some of us are really fumbling our way through it too. You know, we're all learning as we go and trying to to balance the needs of an institution and the needs of our communities. Um, for us, there were all those people that were willing to go first, you know, like when Brittany is saying, there is uh, now they're hiring indigenous people. And I think I have a lot of indigenous colleagues right now. And I think of those first people, you know, that were coming on, like even in, in our institution, who I think started working closely with their communities really early compared to some other institutions, you know, there was like one, you know, native person part-time in learning and en in engagement. You know what I mean? Like, uh, I, I think, <laughs> you know, some of those success stories are also just about like planting your seed right now and those, I just am so thankful for those people, you know, that we're doing that. We're so isolated and we're out there, uh, you know, taking so many hits. And now here we are having a panel discussion like this. And that took years of time. But I, I do think there is a kind of success story there. Yeah, I, I just want to say I think it's really important to, to honor the people that were coming before and were taking those hits and who were not, you know, necessarily listened to or, you know, struggled against, you know, 
a system that didn't want them to be involved. Um, but it really is Native advocacy that has brought Native people into this museum space. And it, it really is Native people who, you know, got that statement from the governor out. <laughs> you know, it's, it's our advocacy that has done wonder, wonderful things. Um, and I think that we, we need to both, as Dakota was saying, honor those that came before and who have led us on this path and then also recognize that we're going to be people who are mentoring the next generation too and hopefully making things much better than it is now too. Like, I, I, that's what I'm really excited about, actually seeing the next generation of me, um, Indigenous museum professionals come up because that's, cause they have great ideas. I mean, from the people that I've talked to. Lori, did you have something you wanted to share? Um, I'm really fortunate to be again in this position. There's a, a charter school here on the reservation and each of the grades, preschool through eighth grade, have to take culture class at the museum. Um, so they go through school here and it's open to the public. So um, it's public kids, it's kids from the reservation. It's a, it's a great mix of people, but everybody's learning the, you know, the real truth that's not in the textbooks that they're not gonna get anywhere else. And so this little group of kids grows up and you know, are better humans because of the experience they've had going to school here and their exposure to primary sources at the museum. And fourth graders do a mission project, but they do it with me and it, it looks much different than other fourth grade mission projects, right? Because they've learned both sides of the story. So I think that's something that um, is relevant and meaningful um, here on the reservation. You know, I'm not, a, I'm not at a museum that's struggling um, to have ties or contact with the, the native population here. So, you know, it's kind of nice to be able to go further than, you know, just starting out beginning building relationships. So we've had a few questions that are um, specific to the Crocker. And I was thinking about this earlier when we were talking about, you know, listening and we've gotten, <laughs> we continue to get really good feedback from uh, native tribes when we um, are able to have listening sessions and engage. And um, some of the things that we've consistently heard are, you know, we need better local native representation in our collections you know we have a lot of southwestern art and uh and of course there's there's different reasons for what we have and and a lot of it is who's going to donate what and it you know we don't necessarily have a huge collections budget those kinds of things not to mention the difficulty that you know cultural arts organizations are going through financially right now but um people you know there are a couple questions right now related to what would you all like to see the Crocker or any institution really? Um, but if you're familiar with the Crocker, what would be some things that you could see the museum doing to change, to shift? And um, if, you, if you're comfortable sharing that. I think we also had a, a docent ask a question about uh, what they could do to be more inclusive. And I would start by saying, you know, do the reading, do the work, right? Educate yourself um, because there, there are just so much resource out there, but also don't be afraid, like you said, to reach out to people. Um, so that was a very long way of saying, <laughs> what kind of direct feedback do you have for institutions that maybe you're comfortable sharing? And there's quite a, I should say too, in the chats, there's quite a long bibliography going on. So please make sure you save that. I wanted to add the one thing, you know, when you were encouraging people not to be afraid to reach out. Also, just get used to saying you're sorry or you didn't know or um, because you're going to make mistakes because we all do because we're all just meeting new people. Uh, Native people are just people that have a different set of protocols or whatever. But I mean, I would also make a lot of mistakes going to you know, I don't know, Kenya. I mean, I wouldn't know, right? So it's not that 
you know, just be prepared to, to be humbled by the experience, but not uh, so intimidated by it. Um, I think there is a lot of fear in reaching out or there's not enough fear in reaching out. And that's the other side of that coin. But um, yeah. I agree with Dakota. I've been saying that a lot. <laughs> I, I bet, you know, great points being made. Um, that's something that's really important. I think that to understand that we are people <laughs> with different opinions and but have different protocol related to our nations. Um, you know, I don't represent the Hoopa Valley tribe, but I understand certain things and certain protocols that go about being a California native person um, because I was grew up in this environment and you know, worked with elder, like, you know, have relationships with people across the state. I mess up. I don't want to say a lot, but I mess, you know, I do mess up and I don't always know things about um certain areas and I depend on the tribes to both um, correct me and let me know if there's something that I'm saying that is not quite right and they're very I mean I don't want to speak for everybody but there's a lot of um, I don't know graciousness that comes with that um, and you know humility be humble about what you don't know and don't monolith, I, I keep messing up this word. Um, don't put us in a monolith, don't make us a monolithic group, groups of people because there's different protocols, right? And different um, histories behind our nations. And tribes in the United States have a very, very different history than other cultures. It's related a lot to political understandings, our relationship with the United States government and land. And so there's a lot of complexity too that comes in with United States history. Um, I think to the question about the Crocker and museum collection standard, I, I'm thinking a lot about museum collections and the ways in which we have tribal people and native people come in and interact with their, their things that were most likely either taken or taken by force or something. And I don't know what the history of the Crocker collections are, but I know certain collections that I've worked with have that history. So what am I doing to have tribes come in and have a say in how we are both storing those things, um, having them interact with those things too? Because that interaction is very different. They're living. Um, and I'm talking mainly about like, cultural collections, but also like how am I doing good consultation and collaboration related to NAGPRA collections, which is a very fraught thing and extremely emotional. It's, I, it's emotional for me every day, extremely difficult. But what am I doing to make it better? And I think that's maybe the positionality you know, if you're a non-native museum pr practitioner to come in with, how am I making this better for people who have had a terrible experience or whose ancestors had terrible experiences? And I think too, um, not familiar again with all the Crocker has, it's been many years and I apologize, I haven't been back. Um, but giving the people the space just to be, maybe their ceremony, maybe their songs, maybe their smudgy, you know, and you don't need to be there. Um, give them a space. And, um, you know, the, the community here was uh, unfortunately patted down and, and checked, um, made sure they weren't stealing anything after one museum visit many years ago. And that, that still sticks with them. And it's hard. Um, so, you know, you don't know what old old feelings and hard feelings exist. And I would say just be accommodating, do what, do what you can when they're there. We heard that recently too from our council, you know, we're working on this reinstallation and, and our visitor operations asked like, what are things that we could do to make it more, uh, you know, Bear, you know, break down any barriers of entry. And that was something that came up for them. Like when we are looking at those objects, we're having an emotional reaction. And, you know, right then 
you know, somebody will be walking by talking really loud or whatever. So it's like trying to, uh, or somebody will come with a school group and stand right behind them. And they said, just try to buy us some space. We have to have space with these objects. You know, even in this, this webinar and what we're doing here, I want to acknowledge that like there's an exchange and we're ask, I'm asking you to share and, uh, a lot of questions are popping up. So I, I want to acknowledge that. I want to thank you all for, you know, giving this time too, because this, this is a, um, no one had to do this and it, it means a lot that, that you are. Um, I think one of the questions that I've seen a couple times is, or, or in, in different forms is looking at, um, and this is something that we had talked about earlier as well, that comes up is decolonization in terms of having native artists having a separate space. So this is the native art gallery. And then people saying, well, you know, it should just be incorporated into general art. Um, do, do you wanna, maybe Dakota, you can share about that because you spoke about that earlier. You know, that is like a real, uh, I think we're grappling with that as you know, museums are really grappling with that right now. Um, I guess I, I have some hesitations because I am, you know, I don't want our visual sovereignty to get interrupted. And so I know that when people are saying, put it in the regular collections, they mean that as a as a thing of honor, but I know I'm personally worried about like what are gonna be the unintended consequences of that. And I was talking about that with some friends today and they said, yeah, like why don't American artists move into indigenous art? Because they're actually the second ones here, you know, like it's still somehow like, even though that's an act of honor, it still is like American art is still the standard. And so I, I'm, I'm real hesitant about that. Although I understand that the reason that people want to just put it in America and is because, well, kind of because it's still the standard, first of all. I mean, that's how I think is, is a little problematic, but um, also because they're trying to make amends. But my question would be first, like, well, did you even ask? You know, who are you asking? Uh, again, talking about this deep listening and these authentic moves. And depending on the community that's with your institution, back to Brittany's point, that we're not monolithic, I mean, different institutions might end up handling that different ways. Um, so yeah, it, it is definitely something that is on my mind, and I think on the minds of a lot of a lot of museum professionals and native museum professionals, you know, all, all of us are kind of trying to uh, work that out. Because I know I, I sat at a talk one time and somebody said something about, uh, and Native art has, and it, it was a Native person speaking and they said something to the effect of like, and Native art being ghettoized or something into this Native collection. And an elder stood up and boy, were they mad, you know, and said, do you think being part of our collection is ghettoization? You know, so it was just, you know, it's complicated. I think it's really and a very good issue to for us all to be discussing right now. There's um, just a quick story. My husband is Tongva, therefore my daughter's Tongva. Um, so as her mom, you know, I'm really wanting her to learn about her heritage. Um, she goes to museums, right? She's a big museum nerd like her mom. Um, she went into this one art museum the masters you know we walk very quietly through the hall of masters and we're talking about all of these things and then we go into this other hall and it's all it's native materials and she's really happy right because part of her heritage is is that but she asked me why is it separate mom and i didn't have a good answer you know and she she was a little little girl at the time um so i don't i don't know what the answer is i do know that Native people often um, grapple with um, identity, and, and we've been working a lot with that here uh, on the reservation. You know, having to walk in two worlds, they go down the hill for school. You know, they're part of the very much part of the Western world here in San Diego, um, but yet they're they kind of have different personas for each space, and um, uh, 
So just this notion of identity, generational trauma, um, you know, what does that look like in a museum space that that, that that space for them is separate? I don't know. I don't know the answer. I want to say I don't know the answer either, because I think um, uh, right now at the dam, there's a lot of yes and going on. Um, but yeah, I, I, I do just to reiterate, I think it's just an important topic right now. Well, um, there's, there are a lot of questions and a lot more we could talk about, I think, but I am so grateful for the time you've given us and everyone who's shown up to today. Um, I wanna say we're gonna save all of the reading recommendations and the resources that are in the chat and we will post them under uh, this video when we put it on our YouTube page so that people can access that again. Um, which means you have to follow the Crocker on YouTube in order to see it. So you don't, it's, it's public, but we appreciate it if you do. Um, yeah, thank you all so much. I'm, I'm learning so much every moment and I'm, I'm grateful for that. I just wanna know if any of you have anything in closing that you wanna share. You've offered a lot of insight, a lot of ideas and just a lot of food for thought, I think. But I wanted to give you all the moment to, to share. I just want to say thank you for having me and, and creating this space where we can share. Um, and, you know, if there's folks out there that want to reach out, I'm happy to continue the discussion. And um, I'm not I'm no expert, but I'm happy to chat. Yeah, I just want to say thank you to the Crocker for putting this on. Um, I worked with the Crocker on other things as well. And I always, always appreciate the relationship that I've had with them. Um, of course, you know, relationships are built over time. So I just want to say thank you. And I'm grateful for that. Um, I also just want to reiterate what Lori said, if you if anybody wants to reach out, I'm always happy to talk about these issues, especially, you know, young or, you know, native people who are interested in going into this field and want to know like the kind of ins and outs of what that looks like. Um, I'm always happy to talk about that. And uh, just thank you. I really appreciate being here. I, I also I am in agreement. I'm very thankful for this opportunity and thankful for uh, my colleagues that I'm just meeting. It's really nice to get to know new people. Um, I'm thankful, you know, I sit on the traditional homelands of the U Arapaho and Cheyenne. And so I'm thankful that I'm, you know, able to speak from this space, but I also, you know, following Lakota protocols, you know, I want to learn from what I'm saying. Sometimes we all make mistakes and I think if uh, people have, or even mistakes are just opportunities for learning. I'm also open to that and to be a resource to the younger generation. Thank you again. And thank you everyone for showing up for this. We have one more session next month and I hope that you'll all attend for that as well. Um, and we're gonna close out with our ending slideshow. Thank you very much. <laughs>